Well, this talks on a disease that affects millions of people throughout the world, and that is anemia. And anemia is when there's a reduced amount of red cells or a reduced amount of haemoglobin in the blood. And of course, the haemoglobin is important because it transports the oxygen. So my favourite definition of anemia is that anemia is a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. The, blood, the oxygen might be getting into the lungs without any problem, but it's got to be transported by the red cells and the haemoglobin in those red cells to the tissues. And if for any reason that the oxygen is not transported from the alveoli to the tissues of the body, that is anemia. There's a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So we can often test for haemoglobin levels. In men, we probably want to see about 13.5 to 18 grams of haemoglobin per deciliter, that is per 100 mils of blood. And in women, probably around about 11.5 to 16.5 would be acceptable grams of haemoglobin per deciliter of blood. Now, people often uh, measure hematocrit values as well. And the hematocrit is, is the percentage of the blood, which is red cells, which is normally around about 45%. But haemoglobin is probably the better measure for pathological diagnosis. Now, let's think about the symptoms that people might uh, complain of. Well, these are often fairly nonspecific. For example, tiredness, fatigue and weakness. And this would be expected, really, because... If there's not enough oxygen in the blood, then there won't be enough oxygen going to the muscles and the muscles are going to fatigue and the person's going to feel weak and they're going to feel tired. And some people often complain of feeling faint, dizzy, headaches. Again, these would be expected because these are caused by relative hypoxia of the brain. If there's not enough haemoglobin and red cells to carry oxygen to the brain, there's going to be a relative cerebral hypoxia giving rise to these features like faintness and dizziness. And it can also lead to insomnia and uh, anorexia as well. And then there's effects of the hypoxia itself. And this can cause shortness of breath. So if there's not enough oxygen in the blood, this can be detected by the chemoreceptors located primarily in the carotid bodies. And if these detect a hypoxia, they will stimulate the respiratory center to breathe faster. So the person will breathe faster and feel short of breath, particularly on exertion. And there can sometimes be tingling in the extremities because the peripheral nerves aren't getting enough oxygen. And if the patient's got any ischemic conditions like angina, these will be made quite a lot worse by the reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Anemia can also lead to amenorrhea, the reduction or the absence of menstrual periods. And sometimes patients will complain of, of palpitations as the heart tries to work harder to circulate the blood around the body more quickly. And this takes us on to the physical signs of anemia. So there can be tachycardia because the hypoxia is going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system to try and increase the rate at which the oxygen that there is, is distributed around the body. In fact, over time, because the heart has to work harder, it has what you call an obligatory high output, that can eventually lead to cardiac failure. And of course, the other classic clinical signs is pallor of the skin, the nail beds, the mucous membranes, they look pale. And specifically, if there's iron deficiency, that can affect the fingernails, giving brittle or spoon-shaped nails. It can give angular stromatitis. Now, this is like red bits at the corner of the mouth. And iron deficiency can also cause glossitis, which is inflammation and soreness in the tongue. So let's think about the etiology of, an of anemia. What can cause this condition? Well, I think basically there's three groups of causes. There can be inadequate or decreased production of red cells that is decreased erythropoiesis erythropoiesis is just the technical name for the production of red cells so there can be not enough red cells produced or there can be increased destruction of the red cells that's called hemolysis or red cells can be being lost as a result of hemorrhage 
So anemia can be caused by lack of production, increased breakdown of red cells, or increased blood loss. So let's think first of all about decreased production of red cells, or poor quality production of red cells. Well, this can often be nutritional because to make the red blood cells, we need these so-called erythropoietic agents, and the body needs iron to make the haemoglobin. It needs vitamin B12 and folic acid to mature the red cells. So straight away, we can see the deficiency of iron or lack of vitamin B12 or lack of folic acid in the diet can lead to reduced production of red cells. Either red, less red cells are produced or the quality of the red cells that are produced is not as good. And other things that are needed are protein, vitamin C, thyroxine, and very small amounts of copper are also needed to produce red blood cells. So it can be nutritional. And also for the normal production of red cells, we need normal kidney function because the kidneys detect oxygen lack. And when there's not enough oxygen in the kidneys, the kidneys produce a hormone called erythropoietin and the erythropoietin or EPO, sometimes called EPO, stimulates the red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. So normal kidney function is necessary as well. So lack of red cell production can be nutritional, can be as a result of renal failure. And you can also get hypoplastic or aplastic anemias. Now, thankfully, these aren't very common, but they're disorders of the bone marrow. And if there's a complete aplastic anemia, then the patient won't produce any red blood cells at all. In fact, they won't produce any white cells either. And of course, that is an immediate life-threatening condition, aplastic anemia. So that's decreased production. But there can also be increased hemolysis, a hemolytic anemia. Hemo means blood, lytic or lysis means to break up. And normally at the end of their lifespan, the red blood cells are broken down by the monocyte macrophage system, what used to be called the reticuloendothelial system in the old days. And this takes place mostly in the spleen. But as well as breaking down old red blood cells, the spleen and the monocyte macrophage system within the spleen will also break down abnormal red blood cells. So if abnormal red blood cells are produced, these will also be hemolyzed relatively quickly. So what this means is that hemolytic anemia can be caused by any of the causes of hemolysis. So we've got decreased production, increased breakdown, and the other one is blood loss. And this is any cause of chronic blood loss. So it could be colitis, peptic ulcer disease, malignancy, menorrhagia caused by uterine fibroids, anything that causes chronic blood loss could lead to this type of anemia. So the etiology is decreased production, increased breakdown, or blood loss. Now let's think now about iron deficiency anemia specifically because this is by far and away the most common type of anemia. So iron deficiency anemia will occur whenever there is a deficiency of iron in the body and this could be lack of intake of iron in the diet or it could be that iron is being lost as a result of chronic haemorrhage. And many many tens of millions of people in the world have iron deficiency. This is very common. Another cause, actually, especially in the tropics, is hookworm, where the hookworms will actually drink some of the blood by latching onto the inside of the gastrointestinal tract, causing chronic hemorrhage and iron deficiency if the iron is not adequately replaced in the diet. Now, pathophysiologically, in iron deficiency, the red cells are described as being hypochromic. That means they are light-coloured, hypocoloured. And they're also microcytic. They tend to be small, irregular shaped cells. So the red cells are microcytic and hypochromic. And the clinical features of iron deficiency anemia are, as we've already described, the normal clinical features of anemia. And as we've mentioned, there can also be the brittle spoon shaped nails, the angular stromatitis and the glossitis. 
And the treatment, of course, is to, it's not surprisingly enough, to, to give iron, to give iron supplements. Now, iron from meat can be readily absorbed. Iron from vegetables can be absorbed as well, but it's not absorbed as efficiently. But it is absorbed more efficiently if it's taken with vitamin C. So if people eat meat, or if people are eating mostly vegetables, if they eat vegetables with fruit, then the iron from the vegetables is going to be absorbed more efficiently. But as well as that, of course, we can give iron tablets. We can just give iron supplements. Just warn the patient in advance that it might make their stools go a dark colour, just in case they worry about that. And it may be necessary to give iron supplements for up to six months to completely replenish the body's supplies of iron. So basically, as long as you recognise the patient is anaemic, there's plenty of things we can do about it. Obviously, if the patient is bleeding, then you need to recognise where that bleeding is coming from and try and treat the underlying cause of the chronic hemorrhage. So we mentioned, in, mentioned that in iron deficiency anemia, the red cells are very small. But there's another group of anemias, and these are called megaloblastic anemia. Now, mega means big. This is where you get big cells. The cells are too big. The red cells are too big. And as well as being too big, usually there's not enough of them as well. And the classic cause of this is pernicious anemia. Now, pernicious anemia is relatively common. We see it in quite a lot of uh, our older people. And it's actually an autoimmune disease. It's where the body's immune system is attacking the cells in the lining of the stomach that produce the hydrochloric acid and produce the intrinsic factor. Now, we've got to go back a bit to understand this. The intrinsic factor is described in relation to the extrinsic factor. Now, the extrinsic factor is vitamin B12, and that's present in the diet. And this extrinsic factor, the vitamin B12, must combine with the intrinsic factor made by these gastric cells in order for the vitamin B12 to be absorbed. So in order for vitamin B12 to be absorbed, we need the extrinsic factor and the intrinsic factor, and they will be absorbed together in the small intestine, which is good. But if this autoimmune condition has attacked the gastric parietal cells that produce the intrinsic factor, the intrinsic factor is not going to be produced. That means the extrinsic factor, that is the vitamin B12, is nothing to bind onto, so it won't be absorbed and the patient will develop lack of vitamin B12. And this is what causes pernicious anemia, because the vitamin B12 is needed for the maturation of red cells in the bone marrow. So in the bone marrow, the early red cells are going to have a nucleus and they're going to be bigger. But then prior to their release, the nucleus is going to dissolve and the size of the cells is going to get smaller. The red cells are going to mature and vitamin B12 is needed for this maturation process. So if there's a lack of vitamin B12, the cells are going to remain too big and be released into the circulation as macrocytes. There's going to be a macrocytic anemia. So pernicious anemia is a megaloblastic or macrocytic anemia. And the patient develops all the features you would normally expect in anemia. But as well as that, the vitamin B12 is needed for the normal function of the nervous system. It's needed for the normal function of the peripheral nerves and the spinal cord. So the patients may be a little getting a bit reluctant to walk and have difficulty balancing and things like that because their nervous system is being affected. So anyone that's anemic, especially an older person, especially if there's any nervous system effects as well, should be tested. And we can see that the size of the red cells is increased when you look at them under a microscope or do the test. There's an increased mean corpuscular volume. So in iron deficiency anemia, the mean corpuscular volume, that is the mean volume of the red cells, will be reduced. Whereas in pernicious anemia, the mean corpuscular volume will be increased. There's going to be bigger red cells. And the great news is as long as someone works out what's going on, is this disease is very easy to treat. Now, there's no point giving them vitamin B tablets because we know the vitamin B12 is not going to be absorbed. So all we do is give them vitamin B injections every three months and then they will be completely cured. 
I've seen the life lives of many older people completely revolutionised by giving them these cytamin, vitamin B12 injections. Their walking improves, their balance improves, their anemia goes away and the quality of life is massively, massively improved just by giving one simple injection every three months. Now we mentioned before aplastic anemia. This is where the bone marrow stops working, therefore it's a very ominous, very dangerous disease. It can be caused by environmental toxins, uh, chloramphenicol is a possible cause, insecticides is a possible cause, dioxins are a possible cause, but quite a serious condition because the patient's going to stop producing red cells altogether and clearly that's a life-threatening life threatening condition. We also mentioned the hemolytic conditions. Now the idea here is that sometimes the body will make abnormal red cells. In some conditions the body will make abnormal red cells and these are normally genetic conditions. So for example there's one called hereditary spherocytosis where the red cells are too round or there's another one called thalassemia where the haemoglobin is abnormal and what happens here is that the monocyte macrophage system will break down the abnormal cells but because many cells are being broken down that can result in an anemia and this can also happen in, in sickle cell disease there can be hemolysis because the cells are, are, are an abnormal shape for genetic reasons and there's other forms of anemia that you might come across, such as sideroblastic anemia and anemia of chronic disease. But I think just to finish, we'll mention uh, smoking as a cause of anemia. Now, when people smoke, they're going to take more carbon monoxide into the blood. This is going to combine with the haemoglobin, forming carboxyhemoglobin, which is a relatively stable compound. So it means that instead of having haemoglobin which is free to become oxyhemoglobin and dissociate to become deoxyhemoglobin and free oxygen in the tissues, rather the haemoglobin is going to be all clogged up with carbon monoxide in this form of carboxyhemoglobin. So it means there's going to be less haemoglobin available in the blood to transport oxygen. And if someone stops smoking, they can get rid of most of this carboxyhemoglobin within a few days. So even within a few days or a week of stopping smoking, someone might be able to breathe much more easily because they're getting rid of the carbon monoxide. So most people don't actually think of smoking as a cause of anemia, but it is actually, it does actually reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood.